I'd, I'd love to be able to spend the first 15 or 20 minutes finding out what all of you have been doing since we've been together here, but we'll have to do that afterward. How, how many of you were with me more than 30 years ago? Anybody? Ah, okay. More than 20? Quite a few. More. 20. Ah, there we go. Roughly. 10? More than 10? In the last 10? I see. So, note that the sweet spot is about more than 20. <laughs> uh, that. So uh, the more than 30s and the more than 20s probably knew me primarily in international finance. Uh, the more than 10s, probably that was kind of my tr transition from international finance into um, more global strategy, although I haven't lost the finance perspective. Uh, the around 10s didn't see me because I spent six years as deputy dean from 1998 to 2004 with Dick Schmall and C, and I think we really had a good time. Uh, and then I've been back in the classroom for six years after sabbatical, and I've been teaching global strategy the Sloan Fellows. Uh, and then I've gotten back into energy. I notice of you, several of you were involved in it. I used to be in the more than, more than 20s knew me doing energy, and then I didn't do energy for a while. Uh, I got volunteered onto the Energy Education Task Force at MIT, and I found it was a bit of a zoo. And after about eight or nine months, I found that I was the co-chair of it. <laughs> uh, and we have now established an energy minor across all of MIT, across all of five schools. Uh, it's really quite unique. We have a science requirement, a technology requirement, and a social science requirement. And the social science core class had just finished co-teaching it with Dick Schmolensee and Susan Silby. Susan's a political scientist sociologist. Energy decisions, markets, and policies. So we're going across the three levels with an economic lens, an organizational lens, and a political lens, really trying to get the undergraduates to see the embeddedness of the energy system in a market, regulatory, and social system. And it, it's just a ball. Uh, so we have, I think, 13 of the miners graduating this year. We'll probably have 26 next year. And so Susan Hockfield sees this as, I think, the precursor for big issue cross-cutting minors for undergrads because MIT is pretty rigid in the disciplines. And if you imagine kind of the orthogonal cut of energy or environment or human health or development as a minor kind of structured, this would, I think, just a superb change uh, in undergraduate education. So that's been a, a lot of fun for me. And then I, in a weak moment, I, I got re-engaged as the chair of the Sloan Fellows Program about three years ago. Uh, and we had a long-term plan of launching an executive MBA, and then the dean's office decided to speed it up. So I've been involved in speed up for the last three years. We launched the executive MBA in October. Same content as the Sloan Fellows, but it's 20 months. It goes from October to May of the following year. It's got four eight-day chunks and then 22-day chunks. So the four eight-day chunks allow us to really do the integrative stuff and I think allow us to have a very different executive MBA than most schools, which I think of as MBAs by osmosis. Uh, and we kept it with the same, same kind of admissions focus of the fellows program, so 16 years average experience. And interestingly, it's everybody, well, 50% live within four hours driving time of Boston, 50% are within four hours flying time of Boston. So it's essentially a North American program, although the national origin of many people is not North American, whereas the Sloan Fellows now is about 75% non-US. So they're almost perfect complements. So we'd like to show the blended statistics. So that's where I've been spending, I'd say, most of my time. Um, what, do we do? what do we do on an early Saturday morning? Uh, something that you can remember quite easily, right? So rat, rats and cats. Uh, this is something I've been working on over the decade, and uh, although cats has only come in the last two years, so if you've seen me five or six years ago, you didn't see cats. Uh, and that's the first thing I want to write up on my sabbatical. It starts in 56 days, I think, something like that. <laughs> <laughs> Who's counting? So all of, all of those other activities have been passed off to other people, and uh, oh, we've also, in, in the time we've launched a lot of custom exec ed programs. Uh, so I, I launched a big program with VP, so supposedly I was helping them learn how to manage projects. You can see how well that worked. Uh, 
but learned a lot about project management and really enjoyed, enjoyed that round. Okay, Rats and Cats Capabilities Guide to Internationalization. So let's start with, this, this, is, this is stuff I do in my global strategy course. This is kind of the core, the core framework of my global strategy course, which I view as just part of a normal strategy sequence. So yes, it's internationally focused, but you're also kind of deepening your engagement with strategy thinking. So why do firms internationalize? Why, why did they internationalize? This is a descriptive statement, not a prescriptive statement, right? So this is why do, is they see some markets that look pretty good, okay? This is a sophisticated group, so I've got to be careful. But, yeah. Access to resources, very important. Access to market and access to resources, which could be natural or could be people, could be knowledge, right? So there's resource seeking and market seeking international investment uh, have always been there. Any other, uh, why do firms do it that maybe shouldn't do it? They're out of space at home, right? <laughs> Same reason why firms diversify. You got a nice cash flow, the market is not growing very fast, the home business doesn't look very good, the grass is greener. Uh, pretty lousy reason to diversify, pretty lousy reason to go international, right? So let's, let's look at this. So, uh, because they're out of space at home, uh, because foreign markets are growing faster, because everybody else is doing it, <laughs> right? Because foreign firms are threatening them at home, uh, because they're good at something that travels, or maybe because the industry or game is global in scope, just because of its economics. Uh, okay, so why should firms internationalize? No, <laughs> right? Just because you're out of space at home doesn't mean you have anything that goes somewhere else. No. <laughs> Again, what's the advantage you have? It could be, but uh, maybe, maybe because actually being mimetic, and I guess this is the sociologi sociologists have this wonderful phrase, isomorphic mimetism. So firms do not necessarily calculate what's correct. They look around and they find firms that they admire and they copy them. And they often don't know whether or not the copy is relevant, right? So an awful lot of, but so maybe it works because maybe you have the same characteristics as the leading firms and maybe what's good is for them is good for you, but maybe it's totally foolish because your logic and your capabilities are totally different. So question mark, right? You can't just, you can't just rely on it because foreign firms are threatening at home. Maybe, again, that doesn't say whether you have something that travels, I would argue probably, right? I'm good at something that travels, probably. I've got to think about it, it's not for sure. Uh, and the industry claim is global in scope, probably, because this says either become global or exit, right? <laughs> either you grow up, and so let's imagine that you're doing something that's very high tech and high scale. Uh, I don't care what stage you're at, entrepreneurial or later, if you don't become global fairly quickly, you're exiting. Because if, imagine that somebody came to you with a proposal for a new, I don't know, something beyond carbon fiber executive jet. Really a very, very special design. Uh, and to keep the company simple, they're going to limit the sales to North America. Uh, I don't think you would fund them, right? So you've got to be kidding. <laughs> you want to flog that product in every relevant market from the first second because the economies of scale and the relevance of the product are such that that game's been going to be global. And even if you're better, you're going to be eaten alive by somebody who's global in the second or third round because they can afford to spend more on innovation because they'll have a bigger capture platform. So the last one is either you do it or you exit. But that's the probably because you have to think seriously. Maybe it's more valuable to exit. Maybe it's more valuable to sell to somebody else uh, who's global. Okay. Uh, now, how do, we, how do we frame these last two questions? And this, I think, is the key. No, the, last one, the last one is kind of a Michael Porter, Five Forces Industry Analysis approach. What is the industry like? What is the geographic scope of the industry? Should we be global or not? And that is a relevant perspective. The next to the last one is, is a resources or capabilities perspective. It says, what are our core competencies? What are we good at? And do they travel? And I view those two as complementary, although you know I'm stressing I'm stressing the the competencies in this in this presentation. Okay, three perspectives on strategy. 
How many of you have seen Arnaldo Hox's delta model? Lots. Okay, this, this is Lessard's delta. <laughs> Lessard's Delta says strategy is about customers, strategy is about capabilities, and yes, guess what? Strategy is also about competitors. <laughs> uh, and yes? Just a quick question. When you say internationalize, are you talking about internationalizing your supply chains, or are you talking about simply marketing your product overseas? Uh, I could be talking about simply, mar I'll show you, simply marketing my product, that's, that's internationalization. Uh, internationalizing my supply chain, that's internationalization, uh, actually internationalizing my customer-facing innovation process, that's internationalization, right? It's deeper. The first two are relatively shallow. <laughs> the third is deeper. We'll talk about all of those. Sure, of course. I was suggesting internationalizing your supply chains are absolutely necessary for survival of today's market. Yeah, yeah. I think that's right. Uh, now, whether you do that internally or whether you do that externally is another issue. And, of course, it, well, it depends, it depends upon the nature of your products and whether, how they travel, right? Some economics still work here. Maybe, maybe you know, I, I've been doing it. So now with the uh, cost rises in China and India, I think we, I'm not saying things will not continue to be offshored, but I think we may be at the end of our 20-year slide to the bottom. Right. It was starting to see, we've, I think we're finding the bottom, and the bottom is kind of shakily stabilizing. So maybe the next 20 years will be a little bit different. No, the capital goes where the opportunities are. <laughs> capital, this is the key thing. Capital and technology, right? Capital and technology are both quite mobile. Customers uh, and labor force are not so mobile. Right? So the supply chain chases the labor, and the capital goes with it. Now, it's not, yeah, there's a lot more capital in Asia, so that helps too. But the markets are in Asia as well. I, I won't fully satisfy you, but, but bear with me. Uh, if, if I was a good, you know, most, most guru, uh, so there are management gurus, uh, and I'm not a management guru, and there's two reasons why I'm not a management guru. One reason is I emphasize all three corners of the triangle. And gurus always emphasize one. And the second one is I'm really afraid that journalists will learn to spell charlatan, which is why they use guru. But <laughs> <laughs> so, no, I'm not, I'm, not, I'm not saying that about Arnaldo. I really, I really do like his approach. And if you'll notice, if you've been in Arnaldo's class for the last five or six years, his class is now very much customer, very much capability, right, in that order. He's still very reluctant to talk about uh, competition because he's, he's waging a war with Mr. Porter. And I'll say, wait a minute, you've got to talk about competition. You can't do strip, but you don't want to start by talking about competition. So there I'm with him. I want to start talking about the customer, right? Then I want to look at the competencies. Then I want to see if I can actually appropriate that benefit in a competitive setting. I've got to do all three corners. So this is kind of Hox's Delta. This is Porter Five Forces, et cetera, industry attractiveness positioning. Uh, I, think, I think Five Forces is pretty nice for assessing where you are. I'm not sure it gives you a lot of directions where to go. Uh, I think if you're thinking about diversifying across industries or internationalizing, which is in a sense moving across countries, and going back in your supply chain is a little different because you're really just building out your supply side as opposed to diversifying into a different market. Uh, that a capabilities focus is kind of the lead focus uh, for choosing to enter different countries or choosing to enter different businesses. Whereas I'm in a business, I'm really looking at the forces in that business <laughs> and how I can extract value in that business. And I should really be looking at my customers in that business in terms of how I can better serve them. But even though I'm going to emphasize one corner of the uh, Triangle, uh, clearly all three matter. Just this is a pitch on why to think about capabilities. Okay. Uh, competencies and competitive advantage, and this goes way back when in the international management literature. Edith Penrose was one of the early writers, 60s. Very, before we knew that they were called competencies, she really wrote about how firms expanded internationally because they, had, they developed competencies, expertise, very path dependent. This was the driver. 
Uh, and then this became hot stuff with, you know, C.K. Prahalad with core competencies and kind of emphasizing competencies as the driver of strategy rather than positions. What are you good at? What are you? Um, and here, here I'm going to refer to Jay Barney's stuff, which is fairly standard. In order for capabilities to matter, to matter in some sense, uh, they, have, they must provide a competitive advantage. And this is Jay Barney's stuff. They must satisfy VIRO. So they must be valuable. So in another way of saying this, they must lead to value creation. Right? A custom, they, they have to allow you to do things that customers will be willing to pay for. That's necessary but not sufficient. They also have to be rare and hard to imitate <laughs> because otherwise you won't capture that value. And you better be able to execute them well. That's the O, right? Otherwise, you will not be advantaged with them. So if somebody says, what am I good at, does it, well, first of all, I have to say is it doesn't matter. Does anyone care? Does anyone care that you are the best in the world at X, Y, Z? Uh, next question is, well, is everybody else equally good? <laughs> Right? Or almost as good? Or could they easily imitate your game? Well, then it's nice that you're good at it, but it really doesn't matter because you can't capture the value for it. And, oh, if you're leading on this dimension, you better be among the very best in executing that particular dimension. So that's the V-I-R-O. Okay. Now take this. That's Barney, Barney and Clark. Competency exploiting internationalization. This is back to your question of why do I go international? Uh, and I clearly started this thinking in, in an era when we were still largely market seeking as opposed to supply chain building. And that's how the world has changed radically. But what, so I'm, I'm sitting at home, uh, I'm doing quite nicely, and this is a tough game for large U.S. firms because large U.S. firms have been international for a long time. So they're not asking this question. They're really asking, how can we better coordinate uh, and interoperate our international operations? This is a very real question for some younger firms. And it's a very real question from firms from new countries. So I've been spending a lot of time looking at firms from middle countries. I, mean, I, I like the G13, so the G20 minus the G7, right? So kind of the next set. Uh, very interesting to look at because there you have a lot of firms that are choosing to internationalize. So entrepreneurial firms, firms from countries that are now entering the global economy are facing the question about internationalizing. Uh, the same concepts are useful to older line U.S. or European firms but not quite as pressing, right? They're much more focused on the supply chain and then how do they change their cost structure and then how do they coordinate and integrate the knowledge they have in various places? So it's a, it's a further stage process. What competencies do we have that we're seeking to exploit internationally? And this is the theory. Do they pass the RATS test? Probably too cute, but you can remember it in the morning. Uh, your students can remember it. Your uh, employees can remember it. It really does have a theoretical basis. <laughs> Are they relevant? And notice. Our focus is on customers. That's where you want to start. It's very Delta influenced. <laughs> what am I good at? And is it relevant to which customers in that other country? Don't even think about it unless it is. Is it relevant? Is it appropriable? That's really a question of, so R, can I, can I actually create value with, with those competencies in another place? Can I really come up with a value proposition that people will, will be willing to pay for? A, can I capture that value given the competitive structure, given the power of my complementers? Uh, I have one case that I teach is on uh, ICICI, the Indian Commercial Bank, uh, internationalizing. This fits very nicely. How do you go to various countries? And do you follow the Indian diaspora? Uh, do you really become a... Uh, an electronic bank, which they're very good at. Uh, and if you look at what they did in the UK versus what they do in the US versus what they do in Canada, this turn in Canada, basically they're chasing the Indian diaspora. But to reach them, imagine that if imagine that they had to partner with local banks or they had to build bricks and mortar to compete with local banks. Uh, the Canadian banking system is very consolidated, right? You've got four guys that are on every street corner. And they're going to totally hold you up. 
So you may have a value proposition that is very relevant to Indian professionals in Canada, of which there are a lot of them. But if you partner with a Canadian commercial bank, they're going to take it all away. And so basically they had to go to an IT platform strategy so they didn't have to partner. In the United States, they partnered with Wells Fargo because the system is my, was, was much less consolidated. And also, and this gets ahead of my game, they really wanted to learn cross-selling. And Wells Fargo was the best in the world at cross-selling. <laughs> in the UK, they set up their own banking system. But it's so appropriable. So you're thinking about supplier power, buyer power, complementers, all of those things. You're really thinking about the structure of competition, the structure of your business model, whether or not you're actually going to be able to capture and walk away with some of the value you're creating. And transferable, really, can you, can you replicate and deliver your business model there? Or is this something you do very well only because of the home-based con conditions? You're good at it at home, but it largely is in the water, <laughs> and you can't really do it out of water in another place. And realistically, the order of thinking probably ought to be R, T, A, but it doesn't work quite as well as R, A, T. So that's hence the rats perspective. So home-based resources and capabilities exploit to create a foreign market position, to create a foreign customer value proposition, right? And remember, rats, okay. Now the next, the next round, competency enhancing internationalization, and this is, somebody said resources, right? Why do we go abroad? Well, maybe we go abroad for natural resources, but we may also go abroad for, to develop competencies. And we may go abroad either to tap competencies, maybe to acquire them, or simply to expose ourselves to a situation that will allow us to develop them. So what competencies might we tap or develop in a country and then apply the CATS test. Are they complementary to what we have, or are they redundant? If they're redundant, it doesn't matter, right? Are they complementary? Could we actually appropriate the benefit? Could we actually build them in? So it's a little symmetry with rats and cats. Uh, augment so internationally derived resource and capabilities, back to your augmented capabilities. CATS, the full cycle, right? You start with your and this is a notion that a firm typically is born someplace, right? A firm grows up in a particular environment, and the capabilities it has are largely, you know, some firms may be born global, but that's still very the minority. You start someplace. You've got some competencies. You look around. You find places where that's relevant. You target the other places. You build a value proposition. So we're doing market-based as opposed to back-end-based internationalization, although it could be taking your production methods. Right? If, in fact, you're making a difference as opposed to just, just arbitraging labor costs. So let's say you're really, really good on the technology and production side, and you actually take it someplace where there's also arbitrage and labor costs, and you get better than the background. <laughs> and that would be kind of rats together with arbitrage. Uh, you start building up some resources and capabilities in that country, maybe only for local adaptation, maybe only so you can compete in that country, but hopefully, hopefully, so you can pull that back into your DNA. Think of this as kind of a DNA cycle. Do you use your internationalization to improve your DNA as opposed to just doing business in various countries? And do you consciously think about it? Now, I, th I think you can start seeing where this is going. Because it, it causes you to think about the organization of the multinational in a different way. Right? Yes, you're going to exploit your DNA, to leverage your DNA, but you're also going to enhance the DNA. Probably not in the same places, necessarily. Right? So the old Spanish joke what, is that you go to Morocco to make money and to Germany to improve your DNA, right? <laughs> Well, you, you see this in many places. I mean, it's, there's some, you go to, over there, I can simply exploit what I'm good at. And this is a nice way to parse what companies do. Okay, examples. I'm going to give you uh, four examples and then, uh, and then kind of put your own firm uh, in the spotlight. Also, feel free to break in on me at any point, because otherwise this is too much of a, a monologue. Uh, Shimano, this is a, a case that Eleanor Westney developed and that I, I used to kind of lay out rats and cats over 80 years. It's kind of fun to look over a very long time frame. Uh, Semex is a company that I got into fairly deeply in terms of how they actually managed rats and cats. 
and I have a case on Semex through 2004 before they shot themselves in the foot by buying Rinker. <laughs> I'm about to go back and extend the case. Uh, fascinating case in terms of hubris and acquisitions and global economy downturns. And, but uh, uh, I don't really know the case of JLR and Tata Jaguar, Land Rover and Tata Motors. There was just a very nice FT story and a very nice New York Times story that I interpreted in rats and cats terms. And then I'm going to kind of give you a generic emerging market software startup based on conversations I had with a bunch of Chilean catalog uh, colleagues in terms of how rats and cats might inform a smaller firm coming from, if you like, a secondary market in terms of how they think about internationalization and how it might turn some of the standard thinking on its head. Okay. So Shimano. Uh, we don't have much time. These are... So Shimano starts in 1921 in Sakai in southern Japan. And for those of you who recall the case, you can, it really starts in 1530s or something because this is a samurai sword center. And so basically the Portuguese arrived and they brought firearms and other mo modern arms. Uh, and the Japanese really took off on these things and they became the leading arm arms producers in the 16th century because they had perfect demand conditions. They had feudal warlords, right? <laughs> so it was really tremendous demand for this stuff. Uh, and they became a national company uh, in the 20s. Uh, they went from producing bicycles to producing bicycle components, so they actually learned to scale up and they became part of the bicycle ecology. They expanded in Asia in the 1930s, and basically, but Japan expands in Asia. They followed the flag. And they, you can start seeing this as rats expansion. They just did what they were doing at home in a broader and broader and broader market. That's, that's the story's gonna come. Uh, World War II came along, of course, and they got bombed out of existence. They got reestablished after the war. Why PRC? This is part of, if you think about distance between countries, which is another key piece, cultural, administrative, geographic, economic, is Pankaj Gemwat sorting. In 1950, the distance between Japan and the United States shrunk drastically. Any sense of why? We were scared to death of the Chinese. And we wanted a strong Japan, and we created an open door policy. We said, Japanese exports, you're welcome in the United States because it is in our interest to have a strong Japan to keep the Chinese from overrunning the world. US policy choice that totally changed the possibilities. So again, uh, the, company, uh, the company starts selling in the United States, sells, selling in the Europe, does some very interesting innovation. Of course, there's an, the Nixon oil shock, and um, the yen appreciates by 40% overnight, and uh, Shimano offshores production <laughs> uh, goes to Singapore first and then to Southeast Asia. Uh, then the Europeans reinvent bicycling as life cycle bicycling as opposed to transportation bicycling. How much more do you pay for a weekend bicycle than you would pay for a transport bicycle? 10, 15, 20 times. Only problem is the reinvention of the industry is now 5,000 miles away and very culturally distant, right? Uh, and then the Americans reinvent bicycle. Oh, so Euro Racing, Shimano goes into Euro Racing. It's a lovely story. They sponsor a team in Italy and in the Tour of France. All of their components break in the first year. It looks just like Toyota Formula One. <laughs> uh, by the second year, they're eating the pants off of Campagnolo. And the inside story, of course, is that they, they manage the internal technical and market connections very well because they staff the racing team with young engineers. Not with locals, right? They staff to learn and to integrate. <laughs> and, and so they win and they have, they have very nice features. They introduce the click shift. If you can, if some of you who, who are more than 20 years ago, right? You remember there was kind of a continuous shift on the multi-speed bicycles? And for a pro, a continuous shift is nice. For a weekend wannabe, right, continuous shift is quite embarrassing because you often miss your shifts. And, and Shimano put a click shift on the same thing that made people, almost racers, look like racers. That's their business model, right? We support, they also knew that the business was with the weekend racers, not with the racers. Campagnolo thought the business was with the racers. <laughs> Uh, and then the U.S. does the same thing. They invent downhill bicycling, and uh, 
Shimano Invents, SPD, etc. Uh, they get an anti-dumping suit and they get an anti-bundling suit in the United States, uh, etc., etc. So there's a whole, whoops, a whole timeline of events, external events and internal events for this company that does a very good job of maintaining a dominant position in the bicycle components business over 80 years through ups and downs. And what I do here, what I'll do now is reinterpret that story through rats and cats. They, I'm not claiming they used rats and cats. I'm looking backwards saying, how could we use this framework to interpret what they did? Um, so capability exploiting episodes. Home-based resource and capabilities, and remember kind of factor conditions, demand conditions, related to supporting industry, all of that stuff, kind of the national diamond of competitiveness. Sakai is a pretty good place, right? They've got good factor conditions. It's a metalworking town. Japan becomes very adept at manufacturing. Presumably in the early years in particular, Japan has strong demand conditions for bicycles. They start going away in the, in the late 50s and in the early 60s because motorcycles come into being, right? And then cars come into being and bicycles become transportation. They become mature. And the rest of the world is getting much of the same. But basically, the expansion from local to all of Japan, all they're doing is taking the business model they already know. And their business model is very interesting. Their business model is quality, uh, innovation, and brand. <laughs> Uh, and very quickly, somewhere in the 1950s, they were already into bundling, where if you want their, their um, derailleur, you have to buy their brakes. Uh, we thought that Bill Gates invented this. Shimano basically is playing the features and bundling game long before my Microsoft. I think Bill Gates probably read the Shimano case. Because it's exactly the same strategy. You grab the core, right? You grab the core of the bicycle. You put a brand on it. You maintain the features. You have a strangle lock over the manufacturers. Shimano is, is and was the wind tail of bicycles <laughs> and managed that very nicely in the same way. It's a much smaller business. Same thing. Ex expansion throughout Asia in the 1930s. They didn't have to invent anything new except for, working, except for controlling businesses at a distance. One of the key features they had was customer service centers. Well, they had to put them in in lots of places. But, right, this, this is rat's expansion. I'm internationalizing, exploiting what I'm good at. It's relevant because people are riding bicycles. It's also relevant because it's the Japanese jurisdiction. There's really nothing different uh, in the context. Expansion, the U.S. in the 1950s and Europe in the 1960s, the initial expansion was still, we're just doing what we're good at. We're just leveraging the market, taking advantage of our low cost and our superior product same thing we develop at home, we sell abroad. Uh, and the expansion to the new economies in the 1980s. The capability enhancing episodes, where did they actually get things? The interesting one is, whoops, that should be cats over there, not rats. Uh, cold forging from Massachusetts in the 19, let's see, 1960s. So they're making bicycle components and you can machine them or you can cast them. <laughs> Imagine if you could drop forge them. <laughs> and so they went to the high-tech metalworking center of the world called Worcester, Mass. <laughs> and they acquired uh, drop forging technology. They consciously reached out to improve their DNA. That was their first step. The offshoring to Singapore and China, you could say that just meant that partly just changed cost, but it also required that they built, they separate engineering and manufacturing and learn how to operate at a distance and actually more formalize their manufacturing. The tapping, the road racing demand conditions in the U.S., tapping the mountain biking conditions in the U.S., those are competency enhancing episodes, things that did not just affect their competitiveness in those countries, but affected their competitiveness everywhere, right? So that's, that's kind of a retrospective sweeping story. Uh, any questions on the story so far? Uh, they started, of course, it was all made in Japan. Then they shifted some elements to Singapore in 1975 uh, because, of course, the Singaporeans were there selling their factory conditions while the Shimanos were reeling with the high yen. Uh, then they shifted some of it to, uh, they've increasingly shifted to China. 
They also, in Europe, they shifted to the Czech Republic substantially. In North America, they stayed, they largely stayed Asia sourced. Uh, I think some of their uh, anti-bundling and other antitrust issues would have been better if they'd had more of a North American center. And I suspect they would have wanted to do some things in Mexico to be more regional. Uh, they stayed too global. They had a very long supply chain as opposed to a shorter supply chain. Uh, and in a sense, they didn't change the firm quite enough. So we could spend all three hours on them. But So now you think of them as a Japanese-centric firm that makes most of its sales outside of Japan, about 80%, where the dynamism of the company uh, in, it's interesting, because the dynamism of company in terms of uh, off-road machines and, let's say, sporty machines is, is Europe and North America. Uh, Japan has re-entered the dynamism because they're in the business of city bicycles. And Europe and, and Japan are the leaders on city bicycles. Right? New high-priced priced, commuter bicycles for people like us that have fin I have one that where you know my Shimano basically captured basically half the price of the bicycle with their internally geared rear hub and their disc brakes uh, and their nice uh, crankshaft and you know old old guys old guy city bicycle that you pay a lot pay a lot of money for that's the new wave of bicycles right so you can go to Walmart and you buy your whatever it is for seventy nine ninety nine or you go down to the bicycle shop and you pay $2,000 for your light-weighted, internally geared, disc braked, right, et cetera. Okay. <laughs> Virtual Diamond. Anybody remember Diamond? This is Michael Porter, Harvard Business School. Why do we tend to pay attention to Harvard Business School? Well, Michael, Michael Porter is to, is to strategy as Microsoft is to software, right? Dominant design, uh, people, that's pretty good. But not, notice what Shimano has done. They basically, they extended their factor conditions, if you like, by getting the U.S. technology. They extended their factor conditions by getting the low-cost manufacturing in Asia. They extended their demand conditions by tapping into Europe. They extended their demand conditions by tapping into the United States. So this is by the 1980s. Shimano is no, the DNA of Shimano is no longer just Japanese. The DNA of Shimano is kind of blended and global. And the way it approaches any market, right, or any production opportunity or any technology now has a kind of a mixed DNA in it. That's the story. So they've, they've levered their capabilities, but they've actually changed the capabilities through the globalization. How rats and cats multiply, so think two dimensions. Uh, home to global to capability leverage. This would be scale, arbitrage, aggregation. How much do you leverage your capabilities across countries? The nature of your capabilities, are they essentially home-based or are they meta-national? Uh, meta-national, I'm borrowing from Joe Santos, who's now we have him as a colleague here at Sloan. Uh, how do you get combinatorial innovation across places within a company, as opposed to innovation just from home or just from individual places? How do you actually get combinatorial? Very few firms are there. Some firms are there. And of course, you would expect to see it grow like that over time. Typically, firms will grow first by exploiting, and then gradually they start doing more complex things and really changing, changing the nature of their capabilities. Uh, so if you look at a firm that operates internationally, an interesting question is looking back saying, where are they here? You know, are they essentially practicing the same model they, they developed at home? <laughs> Uh, just doing it on a larger international scale? Or, in fact, are they a very different company in terms of products and technology and procedures and ways of doing business and everything else because they are international? Not just different in different places, but overall. That's the key question. Uh, Semex, right, so you have a whole period of Semex set. Yeah, yes? Uh, very, very Japanese and family-based still. Uh, and, you know, if, if I were advising them and every group of students in my class that looks at them and says, these days, we would headquarter city, the city bike unit in Japan, and we would headquarter the mass bike unit in China, uh, and we'd probably headquarter the uh, kind of sport bike unit in the Czech Republic, and we'd probably headquarter the 
off-road biking unit somewhere between San Diego and northern Mexico. Uh, and we would probably disperse the management a little bit. So you could knock the central, it's a family controlled company. On the other hand, on the other hand, if you look at what they do, their engineers are very closely engaged with their customers. So you have a, and this is, this is quite characteristic of a number of Japanese companies, right? They're still quite Japanese managed, but the technical side has learned how to get in touch with markets. So they're not totally global in a mindset, but the technical side is, and the, the Shimano story is critical, that they spent a lot of money to get into road racing because they sent good young engineers. They didn't hire a local support team. They sent expensive engineers. So they would connect the technology with the market. So they did that well, right? The U.S. firm typically will be more open and more cosmopolitan leadership, but may, may not pay the same attention to that connection. So if we wanted to handicap the U.S. firm versus the Japanese firm, the Japanese firm probably is, works very, very hard on the technology to market connection, but is quite unitary. <laughs> I'm caricaturing now. The U.S. firm will be more cosmopolitan, a little more open, but often sloppier on that. Often, not always. Generalizations are dangerous. But with a simple framework, you already have some insights on how, how to unpack a company or a competitor or the opportunity. So let me take you through Semex quickly. Why Semex, number one, uh, because we have lots of Sloan fellows at MIT from Semex. And I had a wonderful chance to pick their brains in class year after year after year. And I don't know, five or six years ago, I had the fortune of having Ricardo Naya in class. Uh, and Ricardo had been head of their post-merger integration unit. And then most recently, he was country manager for um, Czech Republic and Poland. Now he's the country manager for the US in Houston. So get to talk to people in strategic planning, get to talk to people in technology, get to talk to country manager. That's one reason. Another reason, I'm very interested in the G13, right? So the middle countries, because the US and Europe and Japan, but the US and Europe, we're not going away. We have our position in international business. China and India have their position in international business. The in-between countries are interesting because they don't necessarily have a right to it. <laughs> think Korea, think Mexico, think Brazil, think some of the smaller countries. They have to fight to be on the scene. They don't have the sheer size or the old dominance. So when you see a company from one of those countries that makes it globally, you say, ah, there's probably an interesting story in that company. It's worth looking at how they manage because they don't have the same home platform projection. You come from the US, you come from Europe, you've got certain tradition and power behind you. <laughs> you come from India or China these days, you have some tradition and power behind you. You come from one of the in-between places, maybe, right? But you've got to work for it. Uh, and of course, they've been in trouble for the last four or five years, but in grand scheme, they are, they are, they've been head-to-head -head with Lafarge, and they've been head-to-head -head with Wholesome. They've been one of the top three in the world coming out of Mexico. So how does a firm coming out of Mexico, which is managed by Stanford guys, <laughs> basically become what, this is an inside joke, because it used to be managed by MIT guys, right? Those of you who, who know the old story. So I actually, I supervised the theses of the sons of the old guys before the Stanford guys took over. And the Stanford guy was a classmate. So here's the... What's interesting about the company is this, is, so if, if you know the history of Mexico, huge country, was very regionalized, only became a nation in the 40s. <laughs> uh, and cement business, every major city had a cement company. And so what Semex did over 100 years was basically consolidated from local to national. So they're just like MBNA, they're a serial consolidator. They're acquiring and consolidating, acquiring and consolidating, and building market power. And so their core competency, frankly, is acquiring, consolidating, aligning, building market power. That's what they're really good at. It's a boring industry, <laughs> but they do a good job of pulling it together. Pardon? Uh, could be like a syndicate. Uh, well, there's the, in the marketplace, it's like most things in construction. In the marketplace, it's complicated. But also, if you look at the engineering and production side, you've got a, very, a lot of very similar plants. And there's a lot of room for alignment in terms of industrial engineering and process. And they, they become very good at imposing standard process and raising the efficiency of these things. So yeah, there's hardball in the marketplace, but there's also real operating efficiency in running the stuff. Right? So those are two, two different uh, com complementary capabilities. Uh, 
somewhere in here, uh, the MIT guys got kicked out and the Stanford guys came in and Lorenzo Zambrano basically said, Mexico, Mexico is not going to remain an isolated market. Foreign competition is going to come in. Our lovely domestic market position, we don't say monopoly, our lovely domestic market position is going to be punctured. Outsiders will come, right? And they, they said, they said, either we become a larger, more international player, or we will be acquired. And we would like to run our company. And we need to become a larger international player, or we will be acquired. And they really got rid of a lot. They were a conglomerate like every other Latin American company was at that stage. And they got rid of everything but cement. And they said, we're going for it, right? We're going for broke as an international cement company. Uh, and then uh, they pretty well consolidated internally. And Holder Bank bought a Pasco, which really scared the Dickens out of them. They lost their easy internationalization by dumping product in the United States. But, uh, but they had anti-dumping penalties put on them. And then they bought into Spain, and then quickly thereafter, Panama, Venezuela, Texas. This is what I call stepping out in my case. Then they kind of grew up. They bought a lot of other countries. Uh, and then they stepped up to buy RMC in the UK in 2005, and then they stepped off the cliff to buy Rinker out of Australia in 2007. So that's, that's the Semex story. Quick rats and cats reinterpretation. Uh, and this one actually has been tested with the insiders, whereas the Shimano story was totally told by me after the fact, right? Uh, so stepping out. So Semex buys Valenciana in Spain, 1992. They're looking for a, the reason why they did this, the reason why they did this is they were thinking of tit for tat international competition. The Europeans, they knew were coming into Mexico. They wanted to get into their backyard. I know this for the fact because a good colleague at MIT was a research associate in the Boston Consulting Group team that was working with them at that time. So their motivation was strategic, right? Strategic signaling. We want to tell the big European firms that if they want to come and spoil the Mexican market, that we can play in their market as well. We want to move up to bare knuckles at a global level. Um, any, any capabilities you think they might have to exploit going from Mexico into Spain? So they're going from a lesser developed country into a more developed country. Spain is uh, a very advanced country in terms of use of cement and infrastructure, as is Mexico. But you would think of Spain in general. 1992, still very rapid growth ahead of it. Uh, you don't have the case in front of you. so. It turned out they, didn't, they went to Spain because they were offered a chance to buy into Spain, and this would help them set up. They got there, and they found that within a couple months, they could radically change, improve the operating efficiency. They got there, and they found out that their processes, their engineering, their controls were better. Now, this wasn't the best company in Spain, right? This was the also ran in Spain. <laughs> But nevertheless, they found they had some capabilities to travel. And you start thinking about it, it's not a surprise. Uh, Semex, these guys are industrial engineers. Uh, the family did set up, or it runs Monterey Tech. They hire the best and brightest out of Mexico as IT people uh, and as industrial engineers. Uh, do cement companies in the US or Europe hire the best or brightest? Typically not. They're going to biotech, right? It's a little bit of factor. Actually, it's very interesting. Some of these middle tech industries, middle countries can win because they get better people. Look at the quality of people that Korea has in the automobile sector. Probably has the cream of the crop. We don't quite. Take it back to the Shimano story, right? Imagine that Shimano is going to Hitsosubashi to recruit engineers in 1958. Because every year they've gotten good engineers. They go to the leading Japanese industry, and the guys laugh. They say, no, we're going to Honda. They make motorcycles. <laughs> right. So actually, there's a factor-based and practice-based reason why the Mexicans are actually better at this. They're very good industrial engineers. And the company has a strong measurement culture, et cetera. Yeah. When, I, when I look and I ask the question in the context of basically students traveling Cross borders, basically, whether it be to come to MIT as an example from an engineering standpoint. So, it is would Semex or would a Korean auto manufacturer with the best students still 
go into the auto industry or into the cement making business or, or would they basically look to say is the best opportunities for the skill sets I have? Uh, the, very top, the very top ones will be like ours that go to McKinsey, Citibank, and Goldman Sachs uh, through the same channels. But, and this is, Semex has fallen off its pedestal since 2007. But up through 2007, it was still probably the most admired company in Mexico. So it got more, a better share of the best factors than a similar company would have gotten in a first world country. And I suspect if you looked at Hyundai or one of the others, you'd find that they get a far better share than in a sense. We get good people, but it's not in the same pecking order. Well, these are one of the equalizers. It's not only cost, it's also selectivity. Who can you get out of the gene pool into a particular industry? Key point, they stumbled on this. They stumbled onto the fact that they were better at operating. They went for strategic reasons. Any sense of what cats they got? They had one cat in mind, and then they found a couple of other cats. And to me, the really interesting story about Semex is they, they become systematic about finding cats. That's what's unique about them. Uh, OK. Cost of capital. Uh, at the time they went to Spain, they had a 400 basis points difference vis-a-vis -vis, uh, vis -vis the U.S. markets in terms of borrowing costs. Spain, 1992, Europe had just come together. Basically, Spain had dropped 150 basis points from a Spain level to a Europe level. You got assets and cash flows in Spain. You lever the hell out of the assets and cash flows in Spain to reduce somewhat the overall cost of capital of the whole company. And they went for that, and they planned for that, and basically they did a levered buyout by issuing every piece of paper they could issue, if you like, against the Spanish operations, mainly bank loans, but, and then use that to fuel the international organization. They also, they'd been acquiring in Mexico forever, but it was not formalized. Suddenly, you've got to acquire somebody who's thousands of miles away in a more developed culture, tougher place. And they had to formalize the post-merger integration. They had to codify what they knew how to do. Just as when Shimano started manufacturing offshore, they had to codify what they knew how to do. Here they had to codify what they knew how to, already knew how to do in merging and integrating. The real one was this. So pet coke, right? Crap left over from petroleum refining. And they got to Spain and they discovered that the Spaniards were burning pet coke. And they said, hmm, right? Wonder if there's any pet coke. Do you think there's any pet coke lying around in Mexico in 1992? It comes from heavy oil, and it comes from inefficient refining practices, right? <laughs> Mexico had plenty of both. What value do you think Pemex, not Semex, Pemex put on pet coke in 1992? Zero. The minute they saw that, they entered into some long-term purchase contracts from Pemex. They arbitraged the idea. Uh, they made billions, in my estimation, on basically seeing, seeing a different practice they said, ah, that's relevant. Let's bring it back. That's spotting a cat, right? Uh, and I don't know. So, okay, let's go to growing up. This is kind of going through uh, basically building out in the Caribbean basin. They took operations expertise to all of these other countries. They took the post-merger integration process. I just put in, in uh, parens, uh, branded bags. This is kind of a Delta model story on selling to bag customers, people that build their own houses. They really got good at it. How do you make cement into a consumer product rather than a producer product? And that clearly travels. You learn it in Mexico. You travel it to the Caribbean. You travel it to Venezuela. You travel it to Colombia. You travel it all around. Uh, the cats they got, well, Pooling, and this is not quite. This is not really a capability. They got production pooling. They, this is better than risk diversification, right? These are very risky businesses. In if you were down in the next room with Rigo Bone, you'd be hearing about volatile macroeconomies. Risky business in volatile macroeconomies, you're getting diversification across them. But better than that, since you've got a common shipping area around the Gulf and the Caribbean, you can actually pool capacity. And when you buy a cement plant in a small Caribbean country, you shut down the cement plant, and you source it out of whichever plant has excess capacity. Uh, and you can actually have full capacity. You can get better capacity utilization than your competitors because of the pooling. You're in a commodity business. If I can get a couple of points better capacity utilization, right, that's money. And most important thing, most important thing, Mexico very strong market position, uh, 
nice margins. How, how sharp do you think the Mexican business was? Hmm. Not so sharp. One of the managers who had run Venezuela, basically, when he came, so CFO dies, <laughs> head of the Mexican operations becomes CFO, head of the Venezuelan operations becomes head of Mexican operations. He looks around and he says, this company is not nearly as good in Mexico as we are in Venezuela. Let's act as if we just bought the mothership. And they did a PMI on the mothership. That's very unusual, especially for a Latin American company. To me, that's notice we're really starting to get at cats because now we're using our global scope and our knowledge, global knowledge and our global experience to make us better even at home. And they cut a lot of cost out of the home base. They kind of, these are cross teams, so teams from outside the country, teams within the country in every single function, looking at all of the practices, beating on them, et cetera. And of course, out of this, they also invented the Semex way, which is their copy of the Toyota way. Stepping up, this is uh, going to uh, RMC. RMC, and I'll tell the story very quickly, but it was a financial conglomerate across countries. So here you have a, an international financial conglomerate. What do you think Semex can bring? Well, they are operators. They are integrators. They can add value. Uh, lovely anecdotes. So the Semex, uh, the country, the person who's taking over RMC, who's a very senior executive in Semex, goes for his first plant visit. Rugby plant, 3,000 employees, huge plant in England. Plant visit, so he's got steel toe shoes, Levi's, hard hat. He's met by 10 suits. That tells you something different about the culture. Uh, the 10 suits were gone tomorrow, right? The operating people, the engineers, would love this acquisition because suddenly they were in touch with top management. And this is an operating company. <laughs> so they were able to add uh, operations expertise, PMI. I put in GPS because this company has gotten very good at managing logistics in chaotic cities. So you have GPSs and floating trucks uh, and ask the question, does a GPS capability, does a advanced logistical system that is developed in Mexico City, does it travel to the rest of the world or not? Think about, you know, how much of the world looks like Dusseldorf or Frankfurt and how much of the world looks like Mexico City. Most of the construction growth in the world looks like Mexico City. It's in really large chaotic cities in developing countries. And a key part of the case is we think of companies based in advanced countries as being tremendously advantaged in their experience base. But in fact, companies based in middle countries may have more relevant experience for much of the world. Um, so that's what they, and what, what did they get? They, they got in the concrete business. I just put up the slump meter. You know, this is, uh, it's really testing the humidity of the cement. Uh, and at least when I was growing up, when the cement truck came to my house, the guy got out and he measured with kind of a hygrometer, he measured the humidity in the cement and then he stuck the hose in and it took 15 minutes, 15 minutes on every run to bring the water. The Brits, you know, they may not run business that well, but they're very inventive. <laughs> they, had, they had done this on the fly, and they were injecting the water on the fly, so by the time you got there for the delivery, uh, the cement was ready to pour, 15-minute saving on every pour. Semex, within 30 minutes, specified it for their fleet because they trained themselves to look for cats. And their merger guidelines basically say within 18 months, the company we acquire will be 100% following Semex practice. But if, if Semex, if 20% of the items, and this is a rough guideline, if 20% of what they do did not infect the Semex way, then the merger team has failed. So the merger team has to impose Semex, but it has to improve Semex. <laughs> It has to be both rats and cats, and that's part of the culture of the company. So that's why I just love the case. Okay, uh, Tata Motors, JLR. So here you have, you know, Jaguar, Land Rover is a relatively small-scale player, but probably a pretty complex set of capabilities already. <laughs> uh, engines, transmissions, a lot of other things, suspensions. Uh, Tata's large scale has got some pretty good uh, production technologies, it's got a wonderful market. If Charlie Fine can have enough influence, they're going to be world leaders in light weighting because you have slightly different safety standards. You'd really like to start from a different place. If you could get the road lighter weight, if everybody was lighter weight, right, you'd have a transformation. In. So 
uh, the articles basically said, we're going to have not a merger of these two companies, they're both jointly owned by Tata, but rather we're going to have intense collaboration between the technical units in India and the technical units in the UK. And, that, and they're, going to, they're going to give birth to something that product-wise is be above and beyond what either could do. It's going to have the Jaguar Land Rover mechanical sophistication, <laughs> And it's going to have the Indian market-driven light weighting and process technologies. And we're going to win in the world car business by bringing together those two capabilities. Now, let's see if they do it or not. But that says, when they bought Jaguar Land Rover, partly you buy an asset in the portfolio. But I think in large part, they're saying, here are some cats. And pardon the, uh, the pun here, but here are some cats that we can, put into, uh, we can put into our overall DNA. We will make ourselves different. Now that says a lot. That says a lot about how we have to set up the management of the company, right? That says that the connection between those technical units has to be much, much sharper than the connection between the business units. We don't have to coordinate sales. <laughs> we don't have to coordinate branding. What we really have to do is find ways to integrate the technical thinking to create that new stuff. So it, this is an, an engineering integration in, in many ways. Okay. Rats and cats and the mode of expansion. So. Imagine a Chilean software company. You can replace Chile with many, many other countries. <laughs> uh, and you could replace software with many things. But let's say you have a Chilean software country that, company that becomes very good in a vertical. They're good for banking, or they're good for mining, or they're good for something or other. They, they started with a home-based client. They've got some really clever industrial engineers. But it's a tiny market. And they, they feel like they're good enough to go somewhere else. So where do you go with? Rats, where do you go with your existing product? You go to places that are close, culturally and geographically in demand conditions. So you go to right, Ecuador, Peru, Bolivia, Argentina. Right? You go close. <laughs> uh, and you look around and you say, yeah, there are clients for which this is relevant. You worry about whether it's appropriate or not because there may be local structures, especially in Argentina. It's a bigger place. Uh, where do you go for cats? Problem. Let's say Brazil and the United States. Large places that are more integrative, more advanced, tougher competition. Right? You're going to go and learn how to do business differently. You're going to learn how to play at a different level. Uh, imagine that you are running a Chilean software company. You're really stretched on manpower. You're stretched on money. You think you need, you want and need to internationalize. What mode of expansion do you use? Where do you go with a where, where do you go with a joint venture, and where do you go with a fully controlled operation? No, nope, here, just keeping it within my two here, just to keep it simple. Where would you go with a fully controlled operation? Where would you go with a kind of a partnership or a joint venture? What usually happens is you go with a fully controlled operation in the close country because it's easy. And you go with a joint venture in the distant country because it's hard. Wrong. I've got to have, I've got to have, uh, the distributor's fine next door. All I have to do is find a good software engineer. I don't need any feedback. I'm just pushing product. It's rats, right? I don't need an integrated system. If I'm going to Brazil or the United States so I can learn how to qualify myself on an international platform, <laughs> then I have to have my number one or number two person actually go and manage that subsidiary and be an integral part of that operation because my purpose is to change the DNA of my company, not to sell in that country. Right? This purpose, I, of course I want to sell here, but I'm also saying I'm going to change the DNA of my company. So I, I've, I've learned how to sell to pension fund managers in Chile. I, I now want to get qualified to sell to asset managers worldwide. And the only way I'm going to do that is climb the ladder and be able to do that in a big place where there's more competition, let's say Brazil or the US. I'm going to have to change what I do. If I have to change everything, then why go international? <laughs> but I have to change my DNA, so I have to manage that close and tight as opposed to loose. So it's an insight you get out of this. Um, that's it. I mean, we could go for another two hours, but that's rats and cats. Um, there's actually, I mean, it, it's cute, but there is, there is plenty of theory underneath it. 
right? So, so you think relevant is really about customers, and it's about value propositions, and it's about willingness to pay. Uh, 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 A is about appropriability. It's about market structure. It's about bargaining power. It's about contracting structure. It's about value capture. And T, of course, is about value delivery. C really gets you focused on what would make you better, not just in that country, but overall. What's complementary to what you have. So let's look at our, port at our core competencies. And what would it take to make us have the best bundle of core competencies in the world? Where in the world is the best place to go to get those or to develop those? Very different charter than where can we sell our product. Right? Sometimes it'll be the same, but not always. Semex is clearly largely a rat's company. Right? It's building a, it's a consolidating portfolio in an old-fashioned industry. That's the main business model. You acquire, consolidate, improve. But they're getting some benefit out of actively working cats. And in a business like that, you've got to work everything you can. <laughs> Even on the supply chain side, right? You could say, well, we're largely going to exploit cost differences with our current methods. But let's think about places where we actually change ourselves in the way we specify things, the way we do things, which things we do in-house, which things we do out of house, which things we formalize, the extent to which we go to higher order design that's electronic, whatever. Right? So you might actually be changing your capabilities there as well. Any, any questions, comments? Yeah. So you talked about acquisition as a, a mode of uh, going into those places. Yeah. Take care with uh, uh, Semex. But, um, Another scenario is people setting up subsidiaries oh, yeah. and staffing, staffing those. Uh, how would it one go about? I'm going to give you a, a microphone so you can be recorded for posterity. <laughs> okay, quickly. Um, one mode was obviously the acquisition. Right. Another uh, scenario is uh, um, creating the own subsidiaries. How would you go about to have the same benefits when it, or realizing the same benefits that you described in particular in the area of cats? Ooh. So, so we, need, we need at least a two by two. So we need to think about kind of the shape of the industry. And is, it, is the industry rapidly growing and developing or is the industry consolidating, right? <coughs> uh, and uh, is our core bundle of capabilities really quite unique? or not so unique, because if, if it's a rapidly growing industry and what we do is quite unique, then I think you pretty well have to build it yourself. If you're a consolidating industry and there's a fair amount of crossover, right, uh, acquisitions are going to be the dominant mode. But, and then the key question is, uh, how, do you, how do you, to the extent that, if it's, if it's about rats, it's almost a matter of convenience. Which one gives you the best access to the market? And if you can get a good acquisition that gets access to the market and will be able to learn your rats quickly locally, right, what you do, then you acquire. Uh, if it's about cats, well, again, if it's something that is not in the water but is really part of a complex process of a company, then maybe you have to acquire to get at that capability, right? Because you can't just go to that country and get the capability. So Semex, you can imagine with this emphasis on pet coke and other things. So they, they basically learned how to build junk, to burn junk. And they become, became one of the lowest energy cost companies in the cement industry. Uh, what happens when environment becomes a serious issue? They are the worst environmental company in the industry for exactly the same reason, right? You burn junk because it's cheap. Fortunately, their German acquisition was really good at green cement both in terms of the cement formulation and in terms of the energy. So suddenly that piece is they're using it throughout the firm in terms of bringing the environmentalism into the rest of the firm. They probably had to, you have to acquire something that's grown up in that special circumstance. Shimano felt like, you know, they were good enough in design and in marketing that they could kind of pick the brains of Gary Fisher and dominate that industry without acquiring although they really did joint venture with him, more or less. Uh, I don't think they localized enough over time, but I'm not giving you a sharp answer. But you can you say, well, what, what are we doing here? Right? What's the state of the industry? Is it consolidated or growing? What are we doing here in terms of uh, e 
if you like, imposing our capabilities, and the better word is embedding our capabilities in the new company versus capturing and developing capabilities from the new company. What's the mixture between those two? If it's largely about embedding, it's much more passive, it's much more one-way communication, it can have more local autonomy, uh, and basically I'm going to choose the path of least resistance between merger and acquisition. If it's got a big cats element, I've got to really sit down and think about this. <laughs> and cats depends much more on the people I'm acquiring also. Right? Which people? Do, because the cats typically come with people. And how am I going to make sure that those people stay and get connected? Right? So I, I think it will inform that. It won't give you a black and white answer, but it will inform that. So uh, using your example of the Chilean company for a right. minute, so you, you had the top section of countries you said might be more rats oriented and maybe right. you'd want to partner and the bottom one where you'd want to go if in. If you're short on resources. Yeah, so let's, uh, let's assume that situation occurs. Right. So how do you know if you're more at an, or how often should you evaluate if you're more at an arm's length relationship and you've relegated some country to the rats category that now maybe there's a shift in that country and there are new uh, methods being developed, other kinds of things that might make them more of a cat's if you don't have the strong connection yet within there. So, uh, a very good question. So you 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 want to think about those things a little bit in advance, and of course you have a hard time doing this, especially if you're small and you're under-resourced. So hopefully, in your either distributor or joint venture, you do have some exit options uh, because you want to make sure you have a win-win outcome if you want to integrate, right? You see, there's a possibility we want to do this business on a one-way basis. The problem, of course, is that our partner doesn't have quite the same market building incentive as we do unless we can really bind ourselves to them. So you kind of look at Coca-Cola, you know, they bind themselves with the bottler by sharing the trademark and the advertising. But if you're in software, it's harder. So maybe, maybe they're going to run off and, and develop, use somebody else's software. So how do you bind them in is a problem. Uh, how likely is it that this place is going to become generative in both, in both how stimulating is the marketplace and how good is the quality of people you can get there? And what's the scale you're operating at there? You've got to make some guesstimates. I think you need to monitor it fairly, fairly often, certainly not every month, but every couple of years. Uh, if it's a big country that you say for now it's rats, but you know, if we get closer to the customer, and if we start being innovative in that country, uh, then let's make sure it doesn't run away, right? Let's make sure that we, A, keep them within the company, but also do the cat's part. Uh, then it might say more about, and you probably have, again, a, at least a two by two, because it's going to be ownership mode, and it's going to be the nature of the manager. Do you hire a manager who really knows the local environment, or do you hire a manager who's your son-in-law? Or, or chief engineer, or somebody who really knows the internal working of the core company, right? And the greater the extent it's cats, I think the greater extent to which you need to have to extend kind of the, the mind of the company. So you've got to put a, very, a person who may be, quote, better than the sales of that subsidiary will call for, because their job is, in fact, to change the DNA of the company and not just to sell in that country. Nothing, nothing wrong with having the job of selling that country. So if you look at a multinational that operates in 80, 90 countries, there are five or six countries that it's going to play cats off of. Right. There are going to be 80 countries in which it's basically a rats company. And it's in the execution business. It's going to be relatively few places <laughs> where you're going to, obviously you can learn something from everywhere. And that's important in terms of empowering people and having some communication. But places that you strategically manage as part of the upgrading of the company, uh, right? That would be the consideration. Yeah, I just think it can shift over time, and you have well, to keep a pulse on it. It can shift, and it's partly it's partly does that market develop? Does your position in that market develop? And critically, what's your ability to handle complexity, both in terms of financial budget, in terms of people, in terms of the size and strength of your organization? So, what I was setting up with the Chilean software, I'm saying, let's assume you're really constrained. You're constrained on people, you're constrained on money, you're constrained on the ability to, to manage complexity. Uh, where do you play heavyweight chips and where do you play lighter weight chips? You know, 
think, think hard about not just markets and closeness, but cats. Yeah. Uh, regarding incentive systems for trying to implement uh, transfer of information between two organizations, uh, GM and NUMI, the Toyota organization in California, comes to mind where top management really wanted to integrate the Toyota process, middle management didn't care. Right. Um, what incentive systems did you find were successful and uh, maybe GM was not successful, but what key factors would you have for incentive systems in that regard? Uh, so let me, let me go to the, the, the CEMEX case because they're actually pretty good at this. So again, partly is it, what, what level is doing the transfer? Is it just the top or is it really the front line? So CEMEX and they worked hard to emulate Toyota. So they have, I don't know what it is. I think it's, it's either 13 or 14 different CEMEX way task forces that cover most of the different functions and most of the different pieces of operations. And those are populated by hotshot middle managers uh, from the various countries. And their job is continuous improvement uh, in, in CEMEX. So they're sharing regularly. And their culture, their culture gets built out of the big initiatives. The initiatives are acquisitions. Right? So when you have an acquisition, you set up a post-merger integration team. It's got an 18-month life. You, you bring middle managers from all around CEMEX and the middle managers you want to keep within the acquired company. You put them together in these task forces. And so you really build that cross-company collaboration. It's really down at that level. And then you maintain that with continuous improvement. This would be this would be another session, but it's a session on how, comp how strategy and learning in companies tends to be punctuated between initiatives and continuous improvement. And how do you set up an initiative to really focus on these integrative issues and to build the culture? And then how do you, how do you have the continuous improvement follow? You're shaking your head no? No? You actually gave the answer earlier when you said uh, Semex made a PMI on the mothership. Yeah. So for Numi, I guess you would have had to take the, the plan manager of NUMI and make him the CEO of GM, for example. Okay. Actually, they did that with Saturn, and it didn't work either. Right. But Saturn was the new exercise of GM, and right. they made the head of but it Saturn. Was, it was kept of GM didn't work. So they keep, there is a point here. There's, there's a point about humility and willing to learn, willingness to learn. And I'm not arguing that Semex is not a democratic company. Semex is a very hierarchical Latin American company, but down at the middle level, there's a lot of exchange. I, I don't have the final answer. Uh, come, when you come uh, next time, or maybe come to class next year, Joe Santos, who I quoted here, uh, Joe is a professor of practice, uh, and he teaches a class on managing global integration. And it's really, and it's the management, it's not so much the structure, it's much more the in management interventions and the incentives, but he's really down. Subtle things to CEMEX, the, the simply CEMEX saying 80-20 on an acquisition, right? You have failed. You have failed in merging this company in unless you can show discrete things you have done that improve. Why did we buy the company if the company didn't do some things better than we do? If you don't bring some of that in, you must have been blind. You must have been arrogant. <laughs> now, the... the GM was much more complicated than that. You know, why, why is GM able to do these things now, and why was it unable to do it then? That's probably the $64 billion question for the Alfred P. Sloan School of Management. So. <laughs> I leave it there, since it's got a lot of our people involved, right? OK. Um, you, will, I, I, you will use rats and cats, right? This is one of the, you, it's very simple, but it's actually, it's actionable. It's a useful way to think about. And this could work equally well across businesses in terms of diversification. Right? I do it internationally, but you could think of it also as a, this is a corporate strategy framework as opposed to a business level strategy framework. How do you think about corporate strategy in terms of exploiting and enhancing capabilities? Good. Nice to see you all. <laughs>